what's up guys welcome back to my youtube channel once again my name is dash lifestyle kindly for watching me for the first time remember to subscribe like share and also comment to my returning subscriber thank you so much for always coming back and watching my video thank you so much for the love and support and greetings greetings to my brothers and sister all the way from caribbean country so guys in today's video i want us to watch this video from a black professor he has come out and shut down the white racist and also we know what the black people they are going through in America. We know how the white people they are treating the black Americans, not only the black Americans. We have so many black people from Caribbean, they are going also through racial discrimination and also they are going through racist in United States. And also we have a majority of Jamaicans also, they are going through racial discrimination in United States. Also, we have the black, the black people from Africa, the African people. Also, we know what these white people they did to African people during transatlantic uh, slave trade. So, kindly guys, I want you to watch and to listen to this video from a black professor coming out and also sending a warning to the white people because if they will still continue to show racist and to discriminate our black people, we as black people, we will come together and we will avenge. So kindly guys, watch this video till the end, then I'll be back with more comment. We have to stop sweet talking. Tell you how we really feel, tell you what kind of hell we've been catching and let you know if you shouldn't have a, if you don't clean up your house. If you're not ready to clean up your house, you shouldn't have a house. You should catch on fire and burn down. Now, I'm not trying to burn down anybody's house. But what Malcolm is talking about is frank speech. That we have to confront each other honestly. One of the most exhausting things I have to do is to convince my fellow white citizens of what is happening. Every time we have to engage in this haunting public ritual of grieving in public. We got to convince you that it happened. What does it mean that Diamond Reynolds' four-year-old baby had to muster the resources to comfort her mother in that moment? I'm here, mama. I'm here with you. What does it mean that Alton Sterling's 15-year-old baby is crying, weeping, because he lost his father, wouldn't see him again? What does it mean that if it wasn't for the footage around Walter Scott, that police officer would still be walking the streets? What does it mean that I have to tell my child right, the story of how to interact with the police because I want him to come home? What does it mean that here I am, I've done everything right, I'm at the height of my profession, I'm the president of the American Academy of Religion. The day I got the call for that that I won, my baby calls me from Brown to tell me that he's sitting on a bench doing an assignment and a police officer drives up, blocks his way, his way out, comes out and says, who are you and why are you here? He says, I'm a Brown student just doing an assignment. The police officer hits him in the face with the, with the flashlight, looks at his feet, looks at the bushes, and tells him the park closes at 9.30. And my son says, yes, sir, but it's only 6.30. And then the partner, his partner, walks around the police cruiser and says to him, and both of them lean in with their hands on their weapon and say to him, the park closes at 9.30. And my son puts up his hands and says, we don't want any trouble. I could have lost my only child that day. And I got to convince you of what that means. We're not going to fundamentally change unless we look ourselves squarely in the face. You learn race in Minneapolis by just simply driving around this community. It's in the very built environment. You don't have to be a bad person. It's how we are habituated as citizens of this country, a country that has been drenched right in the reality of white supremacy. We have to address it. We have to address it if we're going to get beyond it. 
So what I call for is a revolution of value. We need to change our view of government by changing our demand of government. We need to change our view of black people by changing our view of white people, and only white people can do that. And we need to change what ultimately matters to us. If we have a society predicated upon greed and narcissism and selfishness, we will continue to produce the likes of Donald Trump. But it's in our hands. I refuse to dance the dance any longer. For my grandchildren who are not here, I refuse to try to make you feel comfortable. Because I know of a man who was crucified on Calvary, who refused to become adjusted to injustice. What does it mean to bear witness to the virtues of generosity and humility and justice in this moment? It will require something monumental of us, something profound. Value gap, racial habits, fear, requires of us a commitment to democracy. In this sense, we have to become the people that democracy requires of us. That means we have to reject the idea that this is God's gift to the world, that is America, is the shining city on the hill, that rigs the argument. No, we need to look ourselves squarely in the face in great pain and terror and do the work of actually achieving our country. I pray that we do so, because if we don't, we will certainly see the fire. Right? But let me say this really quickly. Y'all all right? I don't know why you invited me here. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to tell the truth. In my mind, democracies require particular kinds of dispositions to work. But something valued more than others in this belief isn't the possession of loud races, people running around with white sheets over their heads or swastikas tattooed on parts of their body. Rather, this belief animates our social practices, our political arrangements, and our economic realities. This belief that white people matter more than others distorts our characters and dis deform our democracy. I like to tell the story of, of, of my father, who was the second African-American hired at the post office in Pascagoula, Mississippi, the place where uh, William Faulkner honeymooned. <laughs> and back then, getting hired at the post office was high cotton, right? And so he knew he had precocious kids, so he decided to move us from the east side of Moss Point to the west side, on a hill, Briarwood Circle. And as we were moving into that house, I'm playing with my Tonka truck. You remember those old Tonka trucks? I'm playing with my Tonka dump, dump truck, and, and I'm making my dump truck noises. And all of a sudden, I hear an adult say, stop playing with that nigga. And it's the first time I had been called that word in that context. So I grabbed my truck, and I took it inside, and I took it to my father, my father who doesn't suffer white people easily. Right? Ran outside, and he did whatever he did. But that's how we typically tell the story of American racism, right? Some black family achieves the American dream. They move to a big house on a hill, and then some child is wounded by some mean-spirited adult who calls them the N-word, and then that child has to work all of her life to prove that she's not that. Oh. But that's too easy. It's too melodramatic. It's too all my children-like my mother's favorite soap opera. <laughs> because I already knew at the age of eight and nine years old that we were moving from the black side of town to the white side of town. I already knew because Rose Drive, where we used to live, because the pipes are bad, every time it rained, it flooded. I already knew because the sidewalks weren't, as as the sidewalks weren't paved like they were on the west side. The baseball diamond wasn't cut as regularly as it was on the other side. The houses were smaller. The schools weren't as fine as the town. That side of town was subject to layoffs by Ingalls, the shipyard, paper mill. I already knew in the very built environment that something said that those folk over there were less valued than those folk over here. Hmm? 
We want to look for the bad racist, right? The obvious racist, but we are making choices day in and day out, right? That sustain racial inequality in this country. My colleague Imani Perry calls it a cultural practice of inequality. Let me give you an example of what I mean. I believe the planet is actually getting warmer. <laughs> All right, you feel me? It's hottest summer on record, hottest year on record. But if you look at my house, and you look at my car, and you look at my light bulbs, you look at the way I live my life, the daily choices I make, you would think I believe the planet was all right. My day-to-day -day behavior suggests that I am a climate change denier. So there are folks running around here who are saying that they are committed to racial inequality, a racial equality, but their choices. I just want my kids to go to the best schools. Social sciences have already, the social sciences already said that whenever you hear that phrase, it's usually a proxy for how many black and brown kids attend my school. I want my neighborhood to be safe. We know what that means. I want my property values to state, we know what that means, right? So it's in the kind of water, the cultural practice, the value gap is, is, is evidenced. Let me give you a quote from James Baldwin in the uses of the blues. Y'all all right? Baldwin clearly states what he takes to be the Negro problem. I'm talking about what happens to you. If you've barely escaped suicide or death or madness or yourself, you watch your children growing up and no matter what you do, no matter what you do, you are powerless. You are really powerless against the force of the world that is out to tell your child that he has no right to be alive and no amount of liberal jargon, no amount of talking about how well and how far we have progressed does anything to soften or to point out any solution to this dilemma. In every generation, ever since Negroes have been here, Baldwin writes, every Negro mother and father has had to face that child and try to create in that child some way of surviving this particular world some way to make the child who will be despised not despise himself. I don't know what the Negro problem means to white people, Baldwin writes, but this is what it means to the Negro. What does it mean to try to construct an idea of the self in a country that is organized in every single way on the basis, on the grounds of the value gap? Not because people are mean-spirited, but it's because it's in the very DNA of the country. And this is what makes addressing the problem, I'm leaving my notes now, this is what makes addressing the problem of white supremacy, of racial inequality in this country so difficult because we refuse to look the ugliness of who we are squarely in the face and dare to imagine ourselves differently. This is hard work. This is hard. The value gap isn't sustained by loud races. The value gap is sustained by all of us. All of us. You, you don't need white people for white supremacy to work. When I'm in New Jersey and I'm driving down Stuyvesant Avenue in Trenton, I hold a set of generalizations about the people who occupy that particular neighborhood. It's known as Little Iraq. I keep my head on a swivel. Right? There's a kind of particular fear that gets generalized, that gener is generalized to an entire population that informs a set of assumptions about how I interact with them. And those generalizations have policy implications. We are socialized and habituated into believing, right, certain things about certain folks. Right? I write about this in the text. There are. Uh, Nancy DeTomaso uh, at, at Rutgers, a social scientist, she did a series of interviews of white working class folk uh, in Cleveland, in Ohio, and in Tennessee, and in Jersey, I believe. And she said she was interviewing these workers, and, and one worker said, I just, I'm sorry, I'm, black people are just lazy. They just want a handout. You've heard this before. It's been informing public discourse since I can remember remembering. And they don't want to work hard for anything. And it turned out that his father was close friends with the union boss who hooked him up with a job. 
Another interviewer, right? I'm sorry to say, they're just lazy. They don't want to work. It turns out that not only his friend gave him, the, gave him the test that he needed to take for his job, gave him the answers to the test. And what Nancy's trying to suggest in this moment is, right, not that there is some, right, op overt racism that's happening. People are just hooking up their friend, friends and families, right? If, that it's what she calls opportunity hoarding, that racial inequality actually is, is uh, perpetuated through social networks, right? And because we're so deeply a segregated society, social net, our social networks are typically, 75% of our social networks are 100% homogeneous. So opportunities pass through certain networks that do not pass through others. Right? I'm just helping out my child. I'm not being racist. Right? I'm just helping out my neighbor. I'm not being racist. I said something jokingly to a friend the other night. I said, if we want to solve black-on-black -black crime in the United States, we just need to integrate neighborhoods. And they didn't quite get it. I said, <laughs> some of you didn't get it either, right? Most crime takes place, right, because of proximity. White on white crime, 83% of crime that happens in white communities happens between white and on white people. 91% happens between, because our neighborhoods are segregated. If we all move together, then we'll just be criminal with each other. I don't know. <laughs> Racial habits. The value gap distorts who we take ourselves to be. It blocks the way to the formation of the kinds of people democracies require. I was just talking about, uh, with, with Reverend Hart Anderson, about Abraham Lincoln's rejection of the monstrous injustice of slavery, but his commitment to the belief that white people were superior to black people, and how those commitments blocked the way from him becoming the kind of human being his idea of democracy required. What does it mean in our country that we can hold the ideals of democracy and when those ideals are extended to black and brown people, we are willing to erode the social safety net? Welfare, for much of the New Deal, right, was in fact a project of Southern Dixiecrats aimed at addressing poor white Southerners. But the moment the face of the welfare state became black, as my colleague Martin Gillens writes. It became right, an emblem of the problem with big government. What happens when we're willing to turn our backs on an idea, a robust idea of the public good because it involves people who are not like us? It means that we're willing to throw democracy into the trash bin over, over the idea, over our commitment to the idea that some people, because of the color of their skin, are valued more than others. It's the value gap is at the heart of our problem. The value gap is evidenced in our habits, habits of living, habits that define where we live, where we work. I can't begin to tell you how often I'm having to, I have to leave the particularity of my experience at the door in order to make white people comfortable. It's almost as if, as James Baldwin writes in Notes of a Native Son, we have to make ourselves blank in order to wash away your guilt. And so we dance this dance, America's racial theater. It's this dance so that you can't be called a racist and I can't trigger your fears. Huh? The worst thing that you can be called is a racist, even though everything that's coming out of your mouth, Donald Trump suggests otherwise. Right? We find ourselves in this dance, unwilling to confront the ugliness of who we are. Just think about this. The last piece of great legislation pub, uh, passed in the great society was the 1968 Fair Housing Act. I'm watching my time. Twelve years later, Ronald Reagan is elected. Twelve years later, there is the triumph of a political ideology designed to undo the great society and the New Deal. Did we fix the country in 12 years? 1965, the Voting Rights Act, right? By 1980, wholesale attack. We don't need to protect them anymore, right? Shelby, 
We don't need to do it. And what happens after the Shelby decision recently, right? We get a proliferation of attacks on voter registration, voter IDs, right? Think about it. At every turn, at every moment of progress in this country, we have seen a reassertion of the value gap. At the moment in which we give voice to the principles of liberty and equality, right, in the context of the American Revolution, what do we get in response? We reconcile those principles with racial slavery. John Adams, it is said, said to King George, we will not be your Negroes. At the very moment in which he's giving voice to an idea of freedom is predicated upon an intimate understanding of unfreedom, a reassertion of the value gap. In the moment of radical reconstruction, we offer right, a vision of multiracial democracy. What do we get in response to radical reconstruction? We get convict leasing, right? Convict leasing. You wouldn't have the city of Birmingham without the labor, the forced labor of convicts, quote unquote. People arrested for what reason, right? Slavery by another name. As Brother Blackman talked, and you get Jim Crow and a reassertion of the value gap. In the context, right, of the black freedom struggle of the mid-20th century, everyday ordinary people demanding dignity and standing, what do we get in response? We get the tax revolt in Northern California. And we get calls for law and order. Value gap. What do we get when we elect our first black president and we think we turned a corner? We get the vitriol of the Tea Party. And we get a wholesale attack, right? on the voting rights of black and brown peoples. At every turn, at every moment of progress, we, that progress is arrested by a reassertion of the value gap. We have to do the work, but we're afraid. We are afraid. White fear has driven this country since its founding. Think about Rep. Thomas Jefferson's notes of the state of Virginia. I'm going to come home. I'm trying to get there. Right? Think about it. He said, I tremble for this country because of the sin of slavery. Right? He was afraid of what that meant, the divine punishment that would come for holding another human being in slavery. And he writes that particular formulation in the section on habit formation. Because he said, what happens to a child who witnesses the violence of slavery? Something is broken on the inside of such a child who experiences that. Something happens to their character, Jefferson suggests. But in that moment of fear, right, it drives policy. Think about, right, the fear of Abraham Lincoln in the second inaugural, supposedly the second founding. Think about the fear surrounding black rage with the Black Panther Party. You know, that cover of the New Yorker where they had Obama dressed as a Muslim and Michelle Obama as Angela Davis. And they were bumping fists, and people were like, what does that mean? Did they just, they bumped fists. Did the black people just begin revolution? <laughs> Fear. Fear drives policy. The moral panic surrounds the so-called super predators, where the, the data suggested was not true. What did the moral panics do? It drove mass incarceration. Think about what happened with the Central Park Five. Those babies were innocent, their lives stolen. Think about all the millions of folk who are locked up because of fear, fear driving policy. We can no longer be afraid. And that fear actually drives our political behavior, black political behavior. As I said earlier, we're afraid to trigger your fears. So we will grit our teeth in the moment which you say something a little off color. Our fear of triggering white fear affects our behavior. So we're masking day in and day out, walking past each other, not really seeing the human. We live in a society where we can tell ourselves that we've turned an economic corner, that we have come out of the Great Recession. And when you look at black and brown communities in this country, when you turn your attention to those who are not quote unquote one of you, what do we see? Uh, we don't see a community that's come out of, right, depression or uh, come out of economic recession. We see a community struggling to make ends meet, right? I interviewed a young woman by the name of Christine Frazier. Uh, I write about this in the book. And Christine uh, did every, played, every, played by the rules, did everything right, right? Her husband died. She lost her job and she couldn't make 
ends meet. She couldn't pay her house note. And, and the sheriff's office came in the middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning, and they unlocked the door. And they told her and her, grandma, her mother and her daughter and her grandson to get out. And they proceeded to empty the house of a lifetime worth of memories. To put all of it in the yard. She said, they came into my home like I was a drug dealer, but they knew that dogs were there. And she said, they told her they didn't, she, they didn't have anything, any place for her to go. And they said to her, you have to figure out what you're going to do. But they knew dogs were there, so they called Animal Shelter. And she said, the pain of losing the house was one thing, but they came with the place for my dog. We live in a country right, where we can talk about turning a corner, but there are people right in our midst right, who are struggling to make ends meet, people who are working hard, who are honest, who are trying to make ends meet, but we disremember, we think it's their fault. So in the book, I talk about the Great Black Depression. I talk about the fact that black folk lost their homes, over 240,000 homes lost as a result of the collapse of the housing market. I talk about right, the fact that over 38%, 40% of black children are growing up in poverty. I talk about the downward mobility as African Americans experience the loss of incomes, the inability to dream big dreams for their children because they can't make ends meet. And we live in a country Right? They says we've turned a corner. They've experienced the loss of incomes, the inability to dream big dreams for their children because they can't make ends meet. And we live in a country right, that says we've turned a corner. Talk about the fact that black folk lost their homes, over 240,000 homes lost as a result of the collapse of the housing market. I talk about right, the fact that over 38%, 40% of black children are growing up in poverty. I talk about the downward mobility as African Americans experience the loss of incomes, the inability to dream big dreams for their children because they can't make ends meet. And we live in a country right, that says we've turned a corner. I hope you have watched that video from this black professor. He has come out and shut down the white racist and also he has give he has sent he was sending a warning to the white people because we all, we all know that these white people they are still oppressing the black people and also we are we know uh, how the black people they are being discriminated in United States. And also guys, he has come out and tell us exactly what happened. <laughs> during the transatlantic slave because we black people we were being enslaved by these white people and because of that so many families they go they went through hell so many people they are also up to now they are not forgetting what happened during the transatlantic slave and this is to tell you that it is now the right time for us black people to come together and overcome these white people and for me i keep on telling you that the biggest fear that these white people they are having towards black people they fear black people coming together they fear black people uniting simply because they know black people we are very strong we black people we are very smart we black people uh, we have power and also our continent african continent because i know majority of black people they came from africa and africa it is the richest continent because we have minerals we have gold we have everything and these people they cannot uh, they cannot live without africa these people they depend so much in africa this is also one of the reasons to why these people they fear us black people and also the reasons to why these people uh, they made us black people to fear them it is because during the trans during the during during the transatlantic slave these people they enslave us these people they came and show us that they are the powerful they are uh, they are so they are they are power full than us black people and they made us black people to worship them and that's why up today these people they confuse us black people these people they destroyed our mind and they make then they make sure that uh, we as black people we embrace them we as black people we we should know that they are the most powerful and because of that we as black people we have been living knowing that these people they are powerful these people they are fearing and also it uh, it it went
went to an extent that they made us black people to worship white God and who told you that what God is white so because of that these people they are still are uh, oppressing the black people these people they are still are uh, discriminating the black people and also you have heard what this professor he has come out and say we know that uh, the black americans they are going through a lot in the united states despite of black americans building this uh, america they are now being discriminated they are now being given less opportunity they cannot uh, be paid way, uh, very, very good wages and also this is this 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 it has led to so many uh, black people still complaining uh, in united states and also not only the black americans in their complaining also we have majority of the uh, black people from Caribbean we have the also African people who they are leaving their country to go in United States to look for greener pasture also we are seeing how these people they are discriminated we are seeing how these people they are being used uh, in United States because these people they are doing so, uh, a hard job but you can see how they are being paid they are being paid a low wages this is tell you that these white people they don't want to see black people uh, uh, developing they don't want to see black people rising and that's why they are going to an extent to make sure that there is uh, these black people they 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 will not rise they will not develop they will not come together because their biggest fear it is uh, the fear of black people coming together it is the fear of the black people uniting because I've already told you that these people they are making sure that they don't want black people to come together they don't want to they don't want to see black people uniting and that's why they are doing anything possible to see that the black people they are still poor the uh, the african countries they are still poor and also they have gone to an extent to make their country to be more great to be more developed to be more uh, modernized than the african country than the, the, than the black people country and also i've been telling you that these people they cannot do without africa these people they cannot do without black people these people they depend so much to the black people and that's why uh, they keep on coming back to our country and also they are confusing our leaders they are turning our leaders to be puppet they are turning our leaders to sell out our treasures thing from here in africa and because of that we have seen our leaders also worshiping them we have seen our leaders are getting instruction from these white people this is tell you that we need we as black people we need to make sure our african leaders our black leaders they need to work for us they need to work a According to the will of the black people because we are tired of being controlled by these white people these white people they don't have good intention to the black people and that's why I keep on telling you each and every day that we are black we, we black people we need to come together we need to support each other we need uh, before going to support these other races we need to support our own races I know these people they have destroyed our mind these people they have they they have made our uh, us black races to be the most uh, stupid races because this is how these people they are saying towards the black people they are saying the black people they are the stupid races in this world because we cannot support our own i need us black people to change our ways we need to support our own we need to show these people we as black people we can come together we can unite and also we can help each other we should stop helping these other races. I know black people, we are known of shopping or supporting the Chinese, the white people, the Indians, but leaving our black store. We need also to change that. We need to make Africa great again because I know Africa, it is the motherland. Africa, it is the birth of the all black people. So we need to uh, make effort to develop our African country. And also it will reach to a time whereby African will be using one currency. Africa it will be great for uh, black people. I need to see black people coming to Africa, invest in Africa, creating more job opportunities so that these people can also start fear as black people. These people, all they want it is to see black people, they are down. I came out the other day and I told you that why is it uh, when we are struggling, when we are having a disaster in our African or in any other black country, these people they are the first people to come uh, with the charity, with the donation and saying that they are helping Africa. You seen what happened during the COVID-19. These people, they came, majority of them, they came from Africa. They 
came they go they went to the uh, caribbean to some countries in the caribbean and also they did they donate a lot they donate they give out the money and telling people they are helping the uh, black countries in the in the caribbean the african people we are, we, the africans they were given a lot of money and saying that these people they were saying they were helping the african people this is how these people they wanted to look so that we as african people we know that these people they are good these people they are helping us these people they are powerful and these people they have a good heart no these people they are not donating willingly these people they are coming here in africa when the time it, where they during the disaster time so that they can give out the money so that they can give out the charity to make them uh, look as great but these people they are having another intention these people they are what they in return they want our resources in return they are turning our leaders to be puppets so kindly guys thank you so much subscribe if you haven't like this video share and also comment see you on my next one bye bye